Hear the words of the Collect for the fourth Sunday after Easter. Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest and desire that which thou dost promise, that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The colic for today raises the question of our human will, and just who is it that orders it? Unfortunately for us, all too often it is we who order and direct it, and not God. And the reason that I say this is because if we think just a little bit with our memories, we may find all too many examples where our desires have led our wills, and that led to, shall we say, some not very good results. And now if we had let God order our wills instead of ourselves, there could never have been a bad result because God always has both our short-term and long-term interests in mind. It is also true that the desires of our hearts do not always line up with what God desires us to be. And this leads at times to a sadness in our souls that our desires are not met. And we really want them to be, because they are our desires after all. And these sad feelings are real. However, if we compare them to the results which are bad leadings by our desires led us to, compared to these leadings, I will take the first over the second all the time. Because sadness is just momentary. But bad decisions can lead to life-altering events and life-affecting events. Now, there's also another facet to this collect, and that is that in many, many cases, when we lead our desires, we do come to some kind of joy or, and or happiness but it's temporary. God's joy is not. When we think of true joy, we find that there is a permanence to it, and time cannot diminish it. A, lo a loving husband and wife, have been to, which are together for many years, have true joy in each other. A parent has joy in their children. The image of a beautiful sunset can be revisited in our minds over and over and over again and still give us the joy that it did before. Now, do you notice a pattern in these three things that I've used, these examples? Is that joy doesn't come from things because things change. True joy comes through relationships. The relationship of a husband or wife to their mate the relationship of a parent to a child, the relationship of the creator to his creation. In each of these things, we see images and echoes of the creator. Now, if we consider marriage, there, there are many differing theories about what makes a successful marriage and what to do in this case and that case and everything else. And yet, Every one of these theories seems to emphasize one aspect of marriage over others. And that's the problem. Because you see, marriage is a relationship and it echoes the Trinity itself. It is founded upon love and lives in love and through love and by love. It binds all the parts together. It's a unique whole. It cannot be separated. The same with a successful marriage and the love that it shares. The relationship to a parent of a child, again, also has many, many competing theories, if you will, about 
how to rear a child and what's a good child do and all of these other things. But they also have their problems because they focus on one thing and leave others out. And this relationship is similar to that relationship between God and his chosen people. You see here, God loved us so much that he stretched out his arms and legs and had them nailed to a cross and suffered and died for us so that there would be no reason for separation anymore. When we look at a sunset and see its beauty and wonder, we see the hand of God in his creation and it touches us in our spirits. Now we could explain every facet of what we see through physics, atmospheric conditions, oh, the anatomy of our brains, and all the other things that science can do. Yet that does not explain the beauty we see. It defies explanation because that beauty and its joy reside in the spirit and not in the world. Every problem in the world today from war to pollution to violence can be traced to a problem with people's relationship with God. These problems are due to sin, which in reality is a rebellion against God's will. Sins multiply when we order our wills instead of God ordering our wills. We are not to be caught up in the things of this world, for they are only temporary and on loan to us at the best. Now the epistle for today echoes these ideas of our will and the sin it leads to when the apostle writes in James 1.17, For every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now this tells us two different things. The first is, is that every gift from God is permanent because he can't change. So once he's given it to you, it's yours. It's ours. He does not change. It's ours forever. Second, it tells us that there are no secrets with God or about God in reality. He has told us what he wants us to do and how we are to do it. The world will change in every way. God will not change at all. His desire is to give us the permanent things and not the temporary ones. So where does man go wrong? He goes wrong, of course, when he does not listen to what God says. The apostle tells us how to avoid this trap in an active sense rather than in the sense of, for example, like the Ten Commandments and saying, Thou shalt not, where he writes in James 1, 19 and 20, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. If every person were eager to hear and slower to speak, and even slower to wrath, there would certainly be a lot less arguments in this world. And in the epistle, again, the apostle concludes in verse 21, how we can listen in that more active manner through meekness of mind and of spirit. James writes, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. I have to tell you that this, these words are one of the most favorite of mine in Scripture. Superfluity of naughtiness. Absolutely wonderful words. Because when you think about it, and you think of naughtiness, of course you think of sin, and how it just flows through your life how it gets into every nook and cranny. It comes into your thoughts when you least expect it. But there it is. And you have to say, how did that get there? Well, superfluity of naughtiness is how it goes.
That's why we must give up sin so that it's not around. We see then that there is true joy to be had in this world. It is achieved through listening to the word of God, living through the word of God. And again, we are not to be caught up in the things of this world. And, and I know that in the end we will all leave it, but I'm not ready to leave just yet. I want to stay around for a little while. But again, that's not in my hands. But that's beside the point. I can only tell God what I want and he can laugh. But there's what goes. And I do look forward to that day when I shall stand before my Lord. It will give me a joy and a, and a pleasure that will be beyond understanding. Again, but I'm not quite ready to go. So we'll have to see how that works out. But when we look at the world and what it's going through, we see that we must have help. And this is where the Holy Ghost comes in. You see, our Lord is no longer restricted by time and place. Through the Holy Ghost, he can be everywhere, with everyone, always. And our Lord has said this, that that's what he's going to do. He says in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For, I w for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Notice the you, not a person, all of them that are present, all of us that are present with him. This is how we can have true joy and true unchangeableness, not only in eternity, but here, but in our everyday lives. Jesus has paid the price for sin. He has left us the Holy Ghost to guide us through this life and back to the throne of grace where he waits to receive us on that great day. That is a joy and unchangeableness that we can look forward to because it flows from God. It is permanent. It is true now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.